In Chapter 4 on Philosophy of the Mind and Body, I chose to tackle the section about life after death. Three philosophers' views were brought into play, Plato, Paul Edwards, and John Hick. Plato and Hick taking the defense side of immortality, and Edwards attacking from the opposing side. Some interesting issues surrounding Alzheimer's and also parapsychology. The non-Western view comes from Kukai. Plato lived from 427 to 347 BC in Athens. He was a disciple to Socrates, who was the founder of the first school of philosophy. Plato believed humans had a body and a soul, also known as the true self. Plato was the first to write systematically on philosophical ideas, two of them being Alcibiades I and Phaedo. From Alcibiades I, Socrates is arguing with Alcibiades about the true self. Socrates' argument is that the user of the body, which is the soul, is indifferent from the body itself. Socrates questions, Come now, I beseech you, tell me with whom you are conversing, with whom but with me? Alcibiades responds, Yes. Socrates continues, That is to say, I, Socrates, am talking, and in talking I use words, and talking and using words are, you would say, the same. Alcibiades replies, Very true. Socrates inquires, and the user is not the same as the thing which he uses. Socrates goes on to talk about the shoemaker and his tools. He explains that the shoemaker is separate from the tools he uses and those things he creates. By the end of the argument, Socrates had more or less convinced Alcibiades that the body and the soul are separate ent entities. His philosophy is that when one talks to another, they are communicating soul to soul. The other philosophical idea that Plato wrote on was from Phaedo, which takes place in prison after Socrates is condemned to die. Socrates asked, then when does the soul attain truth? For in attempting to consider anything in a company with the body, she is obviously deceived. Here Socrates is explaining to Simeus, and Cibis that the absolutes are those we conceive in our minds during thought when all of our other senses are at rest. Socrates claimed that our bodies are what keep us from searching the truth, and the only way true knowledge will be attained is a posteriori to death. He believed the soul was representative to the divine and immortal, and that it governed and ruled over the body. Socrates also said that the body was mortal, therefore was subject and obeyed <coughs> and served the soul. In an argument against survival, Paul Edwards argues that the consciousness, or the soul, is dependent on the brain, and when the brain dies, there is no way the soul can live on. Paul Edwards was born in 1923. He is professor of philosophy in Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Edwards is the author of many published articles and books including The Logic of Moral Discourse. He is also the editor of Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Hume's argument was the alterations of the body are comparable to that of the mind. The last symptoms of a mind before death are disorder, weakness, insensibility, and stupidity. J.J.C. Smart rejects dualism and says that mental states are identical to brain states. According to neurological facts, the mind is controlled by the brain. Edwards assumes that some form of dualism is true. He also assumes that when we talk about personal identity, bodily continuity is not an essential part. The view that says bodily continuity is an important part is known as corporealism. Edwards assumes this view to be false. Alzheimer's disease and certain comas leave a person with a destroyed mind and brain, as Edwards' view would take. In earlier stages of Alzheimer's, the patient suffers from loss of memory, they are incoherent, and there's a decline in intellectual functions. In advanced Alzheimer's, a person is usually confused and is unable to recognize even relatives. The view is that the mind can't possibly stay intact once the brain is completely gone. The same applies for those people in irreversible comas. The other view of Alzheimer's and coma patients would be supported by Plato and Hick. The mind still exists after death, it just can't communicate with those still living. The other part of the argument is that the body isn't essential to the self. Survival theorists on Alzheimer's believe the mind is always intact but with a lack of communication. 
Mill, Butler, and Ewing touch on the absence of direct negative evidence. Mill argues that the brain's physiology mm. doesn't prove that the mind can't exist after death. He believes thoughts, volitions, and emotions may continue after death for both humans and animals. Butler said that we have no proof of the mind's existence because there's no way for us to trace it through death. Ewing configured that there was no logical connection from bodily functions to mental functions and that it's left open for arguments of survival based on ethics and religion. Tying up his argument on the mind and soul, Edwards talks about the last rejoinder being the mind or empirical self and the non-physical entity or the soul. There are two objections to this view. One, the way we speak suggests that there is no reason to believe a soul exists at all. The second objection being, it's not what they refer to as I or what they see as a continual existence. John Hick takes a similar stance as Plato, as Plato in defense of immortality. John Hick was born in 1922. He was professor of theology for many years at the University of Birmingham, England. Now a professor of philosophy, he teaches at Claremont Graduate School. It was Plato that once said, one who questions external realities and death his soul will raise to the unchanging realm. Hicks states that the only things to suffer destruction are those things that are tangible. Since the soul is intangible, it lives on forever. Although psychology can't provide a basis of proof of immortality, Modern philosophers describe words like intelligent, happy, and thoughtful as referring to the empirical self. Man is considered mortal, psychophysical, not a soul in, a con in control of the body. Judaism and Christian views were that only God decided if there was life after death. If God chooses life after death, all the spiritual bodies would be resurrected. Their view on hell is described in two ways, a place for external torment and an extension of purgatorial suffering. Touching on the last subject, many people want to know if their deceased loved ones are all right and, or communicate with them. So we want to know what exactly is parapsychology and does it help. It was founded in approximately 1882. Two phenomena, psychokinesis, which has no reference to life after death, and apparitions, which gives questions of survival after death. Telepathy, which is defined as strange occurrences, which may seem coincidental. Telepathy is not weakened or delayed with distance. There's no organ in the brain that acts as a sending or receiving center. Telepathy is purely a mental occurrence, which takes place in the level of the unconscious mind. There's the case of direct voice medium, where the voice of the communicating spirit is apparently heard speaking out of the air. There can also be meaningful hallucinations. Unfortunately, there is no real proof that parapsychology helps. The non-Western view comes from 9th century CE Japanese Buddhism philosopher named Kukai. Kukai lived from 774 to 835. His intelligence grew at a rapid rate, and while he was still young, went to the university to study Confucian classics. He later on took up an interest in Taoist teachings and Buddhism. Now Plato did see the body as something to be gotten rid of, and a better part that we are starving for is in the unchanging realm. Kukai, on the other hand, believed that the body and the soul are not separate. He doesn't see this unchanging realm as the ultimate thing to strive for, but our time spent here in making peace with our bodies. My own philosophical view tends to go more in the direction of Plato and John Hick. I do believe that the soul is separate from the body. There are some days when I look at myself and feel as though I am not really what I see in the mirror and that I'm, that I'm my soul standing away looking at this being, my body. I absolutely cannot buy Kukai's view at all. If this is all there is, terrorism, suffering, and on a lighter note, excess work to get nowhere, it would be completely depressing. It would seem as if all the work done was for nothing and I would want to just live every day as if I wished, as, as I wished, since this was going to be my heaven, so to speak. I do believe that souls will rise up to the unchanging realm, some kind of wonderful place we could only dream of.